We are so delighted to see you back at the Fondation after the difficult years of the pandemic. A warm welcome to you and your um, travel members, traveling members. <laughs> when you came in 2019 to visit the Fondation Béla, it was a warm day, it was April, but nevertheless it was a warm day and um, we had to wear hats. <laughs> <laughs> so you and your team have been of invaluable help in making this exhibition happen. About 90% of her oeuvre are in museums and private collections in the USA. The explicit support of the George O'Keefe Museum of this project was crucial to get all the wonderful loans. As is the fact that more than a third of all the works in the exhibition are on loan from your museum. So, therefore, before we start the conversation, may I ask you to briefly tell us what is the George O'Keefe Museum? How did it come into being? And what is its task? Absolutely. First, it's just a joy to be here. Thank you for inviting me to join you this evening. Uh, I am here with a number of the museum's uh, trustees and supporters, so it's really a fun chance for those of us from the O'Keefe Museum to see this beautiful exhibition realized. The George O'Keefe Museum opened in the summer of 1997. We are 25 years old, just like your institution. Uh, so relatively speaking, we're young. Uh, we were created really because of the passion that uh, people were expressing to see the works of Georgia O'Keefe. In the United States, she's very strongly associated with New Mexico and with Santa Fe, which is interesting because she never actually spent much time in Santa Fe. What she really loved was the community of Abiquiu, uh, and then just slightly further beyond Abiquiu, a place called Ghost Ranch. Those were her homes in New Mexico for many, many years. She only lived in Santa Fe at the very end of her life for a few years to be close to her doctors. But nonetheless, Santa Fe was the tourist destination most associated with George O'Keeffe's artwork. There was very little of her work visible in town. The, the local fine arts museum had a few paintings, but they were not always on view. So the idea was to create a destination where people could see and understand the work and life of George O'Keeffe. Uh, that was the brain um, storm, the brainchild of a woman named Anne Marion. Anne was a collector. Uh, she was a, a Texas ranch woman, an oil um, businesswoman, uh, and she believed passionately in the importance of George O'Keeffe's artwork and, and example. So with friends, she created the museum and opened it um, in a very rapid period of time and built the first portions of our collection by giving her own collection of George O'Keeffe's, as well as uh, helping to acquire many other O'Keeffe's. In subsequent years, in 2006, we merged with the Georgia O'Keeffe Foundation, which was part of the settlement of her estate, giving us many, many more paintings, as well as an entire archive of her personal life. So in addition to the paintings we have, we also have the documents, um, letters and correspondence from her own lifetime. We have the paints, the brushes, uh, the canvases that, that she left. We have the rocks, the shells, the bones that she collected and used as subjects in her paintings and to decorate her homes. We have her clothing, her furnishings, her camping equipment. We have just about anything you can imagine to illuminate the life of this, this remarkable creative individual. And so for 25 years, we've been sharing the stories of her life and, and trying to perpetuate her legacy. So for us to be able to share um, perhaps the most significant uh, American woman artist um, of, of the 20th century um, with global audiences is a big part of sharing that legacy. And so it's a joy to be able to bring O'Keeffe to Switzerland. From what I understand, your interest and in research before joining the museum in 2013 was based on American art since 1900 and on New Mexico and its history. But it seems that George O'Keefe herself was not part of your main fo focus. How and why did you become interested in George O'Keefe? Indeed, uh, my, <laughs> my research, my background academically 
was focused on American art, and I did a, a, a master's thesis on Spanish colonial culture, uh, kind of the, the culture of 18th and uh, 19th century New Mexico. Um, my dissertation was about the creation of the museum system in Santa Fe. Uh, Santa Fe has a very significant state-supported uh, museum system that includes a folk art museum, a fine arts museum, a museum of Indian art and culture, um, a laboratory of anthropology, many other uh, remarkable institutions in a relatively small town of 70,000 people. I intentionally ended my study uh, about 1929, <laughs> so I wouldn't have to deal with Georgia O'Keeffe. Because <laughs> so I thought, if I've got to talk about Georgia O'Keeffe, it's going to be a much more complicated project, and she'll just <laughs> overshadow everything else. So I, I very much tried to avoid Georgia O'Keeffe. Now, what I should also mention is my mother is an artist, and her favorite artist, her, her most important source of inspiration, is Georgia O'Keeffe. <laughs> So I grew up in a home with lots of George O'Keeffe books and lots of George O'Keeffe reproductions and just thought, well, I, I don't need to study George O'Keeffe. That's been done. Uh, there's, there's nothing more to say about that artist. Well, life has a funny way of bringing things back around. Uh, decades later, I am working in Boston and was invited to apply for a position as the senior curator at the O'Keeffe Museum. Uh, and ended up taking that position. Uh, it seemed like all roads pointed back to Santa Fe and pointed back to Georgia O'Keeffe. <laughs> and I have no regrets. Her example is singular. Uh, she has such a remarkable force of creativity, of independence. Uh, her spirit is just in in indomitable as an example of, of how to live one's life um, with intentionality and thoughtfulness. And so it's endlessly rewarding. And there's a lot more to be said, it turns out. In an interview in 2014, that was soon after um, you started at the museum, you explained that the George O'Keeffe Museum it has started, I quote, to think long term about O'Keeffe's legacy and her role in, a in American modernism. Eight years have passed since. It would be interesting to hear more about how this undertaking has developed and specifically if its goals have changed since. Previously, for example, <clears throat> there was no explicit talk about the region's indigenous people and the relationship of the museum to them. That has certainly changed. Now, how did the shift of emphasis come about? And what does it mean for our understanding of George O'Keeffe's art? It's, it's a great question. And I think I'll answer that in kind of two, two, two pathways. Um, first of all, the O'Keeffe Museum has, has matured over time. So we started off um, really with a, a pretty traditional model of, of a fine arts museum. We were about her artwork, not about her biography. We very intentionally, very explicitly did not talk much about her life. We would repeat a quote that she herself uh, often used, saying that where and how I've lived is unimportant. It's what I've done that matters. And so we, we would continue to tell people, you shouldn't be asking about her life. You shouldn't be asking about her interests. You shouldn't be talking about her love life. Uh, you should only be looking at the paintings. Uh, the truth is, her life is fascinating, it <laughs> is remarkable, and you can't really stop at just looking at the artwork. And so I think we learn from our audiences that the biography matters, and that she is again a singular individual and a singular example, and so you can learn a lot from looking at every aspect of, of how she lived. And I used the word intentionality earlier. Uh, this is an individual who brought care and an aesthetic sensibility to everything she did the way she dressed, the way she arranged her homes, the way she gardened, uh, just everything she did, she brought thoughtfulness and care to. So, so the example of her biography is important. And in recent years, I think I would say since 2014, um, more and more of the personal story is being shared in the galleries. More and more of the objects that we have that illuminate that and are, are physical touchstones to our own presence are being shared in the galleries. So we've, we've shifted, I think, to really think of her as a holistic person. And that invites us to think about her in the context of her own times. Who were her friends? Who was she associating with? 
what ideas was she excited by? What was she reading? Uh, that begins to introduce us to this remarkable network of um, artists and intellectuals, authors, choreographers, musicians, um, designers. Um, my, my group had the good fortune to visit the Vitra this morning. Uh, she was very close friends with Alexander Girard, close friends with the Eames, uh, close friends with Noguchi. She had amazing objects throughout her life as a result of these friendships. Uh, so, there, so you're just in this amazing kind of world of, of ideas and, 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 and beautiful objects. The other piece of that context is understanding where she lived in northern New Mexico. And New Mexico is a complicated place. Um, it's had a, a fascinating history but it's a history marked by conflict. Uh, it's a history marked by contest over limited resources. Uh, so it has been inhabited by Native Americans, indigenous populations. Um, recent research uh, at White Sands has revealed human presence in that area going back 20,000 years. So the, the peoples, the native peoples of that place have been there a very long time and have, have left their presence uh, marked across the land. The Spanish colonization um, of, New, of originally Mexico and then up into um, Nuevo, Nuevo Mexico, New Mexico, um, brought enormous conflict. Um, and the resonance of that colonization remains to this day. In the 19th century, uh, with the arrival of the United States and the, the arrival of the railway, um, another layer of conflict was brought into the region. Those of us that live there still feel and see these conflicts played out every day uh, as, as we look at the, the limited resources available um, in New Mexico and the kind of fight for those, for, for those resources. O'Keefe moves into this complicated place of, of conflict uh, with substantial resources. She's a very wealthy white individual who can make her own life. Uh, moving into an, a, a Hispanic Catholic community uh, that is surrounded by indigenous communities. So there's, she's crossing multiple lines. And it's important to understand how that shaped her, but also the impact she had during her lifetime on the peoples of those communities. And I think it's also become very important for us as an institution to understand how our presence and the presence of the tourists that are drawn to New Mexico by the idea of seeing George O'Keeffe's homes and landscapes, um, they also have an impact. They can be an economic resource and bring, re and bring financial gain to the region, but they also can displace the peoples whose families have lived there for generations. Um, no one wants to feel like they live in Disneyland. And that is the way that some of the members of the Abiquiu community have felt when they have tourists driving in, driving through the front yards, kind of peering in their windows, looking for some, some evidence of George O'Keefe. Uh, so we are really trying to reconcile the historic and contemporary impacts that her, her, her fame and success have had. And think about how as, a, as an institution based in that community, we can support the well-being of our, our families and our neighbors in those communities. When I was installing the exhibition, I, it seemed to me that her first um, long stay in four months or so in, um, in, in New Mexico was in 1929. And um, in, the, the next, in um, this room, we assembled almost all, not, I mean, all works in this room are from 29. And, it, and in the next room, then, if you remember, are all um, from many different years, um, landscapes, nature views from New Mexico. And it seemed to me that in this first year, which was in Teos, mm -hmm. um, she had a kind of, still a kind of touristic um, look mm -hmm. at things like the, the cross or the Pueb Taos Pueblo, Pueblo the, et cetera. So is this, can you, and then somehow when she came 
more often regularly to New Mexico. This was, she, it was not anymore a touristic look. Is this impression correct? I, I think it is. I think it's, it's appropriate. You know, she's, she's living in New York City at this point, b before she comes to New Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, she's had the most, the 1920s were her most prolific, successful decade. She's also at a place in her relationship with Alfred Stieglitz where she is, she's very hurt and frustrated uh, and needs to kind of draw a line in some way. So New Mexico is an escape. She's one of many, many, many East Coast artists and intellectuals who, who came to New Mexico looking for something. Uh, many of them were invited by Mabel Dodge Lujan, uh, who was O'Keeffe's host that first summer. Mabel Dodge was uh, kind of intellectual salon, maintained an intellectual salon in New York City. Um, and she found Taos as a way to seek a kind of um, antidote to, the, to what she was seeing in terms of American culture in New York. She was looking for a kind of utopia. Um, there's a lot of escapism involved in trying to kind of find an alternative um, way um, to, to live. Mabel brings many, many significant artists to New Mexico. Most pass through for one or two summers. Um, few embedded themselves in the way that O'Keeffe did mm -hmm. and ended up spending so much mm -hmm. of her life there. Mm -hmm. For O'Keeffe, that first summer is uh, um, incredibly reinvigorating. She takes on almost a dozen entirely new subjects after, after a decade of kind of declining um, range in her subject matter, suddenly she's painting all of these things you're describing, crosses and churches and the landscape and rodeos and there's this explosion of new colors. She, she adopts a new palette that year. Uh, she finds these bones, she starts shipping bones back to New York to paint. Uh, so suddenly she's just creatively reinvigorated. She also renegotiates her relationship with Alfred Stieglitz. He spends the entire summer writing her, begging her to come home. <laughs> He's beside himself. He threatens to burn all of his photographs if she doesn't come back to him. And she writes these very poignant letters and essentially says, little boy, the best thing I can do for both of us is stay here. <laughs> You'll be fine, get over it, I'll be home at the end of the summer. And she really takes control of the relationship. And I, so I think, you know, New Mexico saved her in many, many ways. Uh, one of the, the points I'm trying to make in the way we tell the story is, George O'Keefe didn't discover New Mexico. Mm -hmm. It was there, it was doing just fine. Uh, but what happened was it really brought her back to life creatively and emotionally. Uh, so in subsequent years, she, she, she kind of tires of Mabel Dodge pretty quickly. And Mabel Dodge was famous for being a, a bit intrusive as a hostess. Um, she was kind of in everyone's business that was one of her guests. So O'Keefe starts finding other places to stay pretty quickly and eventually finds Ghost Ranch, um, which at that time, this, this was a, a kind of dude ranch uh, uh, in, a, in a remarkable landscape. Uh, it took, uh, it would take the better part of a day uh, to get there um, after you had traveled across the country to get to Santa Fe. That uh, was very remote and very isolated and would have felt like the end of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so that for her was perfect. She could walk in the desert and paint and not be disturbed. And I think you see her with each year becoming more and more acquainted with the place. Um, and, and it was, it was the fascination with the cultures, with the, with the um, you know, she paints the Katsina, Katsinam subjects, which are inspired by um, Hopi and Pueblo, indigenous um, spiritual figures. Uh, she paints the Rancho de Taos church. She's looking at the kind of Catholic, Catholic imagery and of course the landscape. And I think you see her move from tourist to resident mm -hmm. in her own emotion and her own painting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the next one. And God's next. Um, one of your first published texts on O'Keeffe appeared in the catalogue of the exhibition um, at Tate Modern in 2016, discussing the various places mm -hmm. where she lived and how they influenced her work. We tend, we tend to overlook that George O'Keeffe's life and career start, <clears throat> started long before her regular extended stays in New Mexico and how far she had already progressed 
before she began visiting the region. This was for me also here a discovery working on this exhibition. Was it at the time um, a discovery for you as it has been for many? It was. You know, I mentioned that the O'Keeffe Museum was, was created in Santa Fe because so many people associated her with New Mexico. Uh, you know, she was the first to really create distinctly new subjects, those bones in the landscape, and people just kind of assumed, and she spent so much of her light, late life there that they assumed she was kind of a New Mexico artist. Uh, and, and the truth is, she was very much an American artist. Uh, she was born in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. Uh, she went to school in Chicago and New York. She lived in Virginia and South Carolina. She traveled constantly around the country, spending time you know, up and down the eastern seaboard, traveling up into Canada. Um, even when she was in New Mexico, she would go that very first summer. She did this rather insane road trip. And I use road trip lightly because there were no paved roads for most of this, this route from Ghost Ranch to the west to the Grand Canyon, up into Utah, back into Colorado, and then down to return to New Mexico. Um, for those of you that have visited the American West, it is very big. <laughs> that, that trip would be difficult and, and long today with hot paved highways and air conditioned cars. She had none of that, uh, but she was intrepid and she was you know, curious and loved to explore. Uh, Alfred Stieglitz, this is very much what he responded to was the degree to which she represented America. He was a proponent for a kind of national art trying to see uh, what American artists could do to differentiate themselves from European precedents and really create something distinctly American. George O'Keeffe, again, you know, born in, in Wisconsin, living all over the, the eastern seaboard. At the time that, O'Keefe, or that Stieglitz really got to know her, she was uh, living and working in West Texas. So she's, she's quintessentially American in so many ways. She never studied in Europe, unlike so many of her peers. Uh, so she, she represented something distinct to him. She wrote about this in talking about the great American thing, this, I, this idea that everyone wanted to make the great American play, the great American novel, and she thought it was ludicrous because these artists would rather be in Paris than in New York, <laughs> or much less outside of New York, anywhere else in America. And she talked about how much of America she had explored and that she was going to kind of make fun of them by painting a painting of a, a cow's skull against red, a red, white, and blue background mm, and calling it the great American thing, <laughs> kind of in their face. But I think there's a lot of talk about sense of place with George O'Keefe. Um, we, we, we use this phrase to think about how much she distilled the essence of what, what made a place distinct and unique, uh, its landscape, its, its cultures, its peoples. Uh, and it, it wasn't just one place. And when I started looking at how many places um, she had lived, she had visited, that had shaped her work, where she had, re she had painted, you know, I didn't even mention New York and Lake George, uh, where she had really gotten to know the, the landscape and location. You see her as this, this much more peripatetic artist who's constantly scanning the world and the landscape. And in later years, uh, she began to travel voraciously. Mm -hmm. I mean, she could not stay put um, for more than a few months before launching another global travel. There's this great quote after one of these, these world trips where she said, I've seen enough for a lifetime, I never need to travel again. And within three months, she's planning another exhaustive tour of India and the Middle East. I mean, she's just, she's insatiable in her desire. But this started in, in 1953. Much later, yeah. And um, this is also interesting, she had such a long life. And so when she, when she came first to New Mexico, she was 42, 42 years old. When she, when she um, settled down in New Mexico, she was 59. Mm -hmm. um, and in her mixed mid-60s, she started to travel abroad. I think that's very impressive um, to imagine. Um, I'm a little older than some of you. Others are in, at my age, so, so you can imagine it's at her long life. She really was productive and made developments again and again. Yeah. I, I also I, li I love that you point out how old she was because I think it's very easy for people to uh, kind of think that she was younger 
and, and less, less mature and formed than she was. Uh, when she met Alfred Stieglitz, she's almost 30. And That's also a, important. Yeah. A lot of people want to kind of act like she was this young schoolgirl who had no agency and was just kind of taken in by this older older artist. And that's just not fair no, or true. No. No, no. She, <laughs> she, was, she was a very mm. s secure person who knew herself and knew exactly what she wanted in life. Yeah, in, in a way, she is always older, that one thinks. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> um, next one, please. In the first room of the exhibition, it is fascinating to see how many ideas that O'Keeffe developed later were already emerging in the early years in Texas, which is 1916 to 18. For instance, the, the coexistence of abstract and figurative, or, and above all, the new way of addressing nature and la landscape. This was, for me, also the most um, um, exciting discovery um, working on this exhibition that I, uh, it seems to me that she gave um, really, she had a new look to nature and um, landscape, which was also um, very, very much, it was more an experience she transported into an image than just a view. And then um, the next, no, snackste, no more lines. This is a small watercolor and not very um, spectacular. Um, and when I saw this and read the title and um, thought this is a tent door at night, so a person, she herself, probably sitting in the tent or lying in the tent at night and looking um, outside. I, th I thought this is such a um, weird, but also um, interesting and um, revealing um, experience she put in an image. She transformed into an image and somehow this became this is a kind of guideline that she is always um, walking through landscapes, etc., etc. And um, it seems to me, and this is the question, that today her view of nature has moved much more into our focus than earlier. Earlier it was modernism, it was abstract, art, etc., etc. She is part of the contemporary artists, mm -hmm. American artists. But today, when we are aware that nature is something very precious and we don't just own it, this um, look um, is interesting. I, I think, you know, one, our first gallery um, in the, the, the way we present the story currently uh, focuses on two ideas, abstraction and nature. And uh, they're really uh, core kind of foundational concepts for Georgia O'Keeffe. And what, what is interesting, and in, was, as you were asking that question, I was thinking, you know, working with a single artist for a decade, that is not what most art historians or curators do. You, you're kind of always working with another artist, another idea. Um, so you begin to see patterns over time that you might not notice or pay much attention to. And she at an early age adopts pure abstraction or experiments with pure abstraction, meaning creating images that, that are, are a kind of visceral response to the way she's experiencing the world that have no um, reference to our visual perception. She's not trying to paint things that look the way they appear to our eyes. She's feeling free, as some of those early works show, um, to use paint and color in a very expressive way to capture something emotional that can't, like a symphony, that it moves you, but it, there's no, there's no, you know, it's not a transcription of ideas. It's just motion expressed. And at the same time, she never stops looking at mm -hmm. the natural world. She's a farm girl. She was, she was, she was raised in the outdoors. Um, she never stopped hiking. She, I mean, to the very end of her life, as long as her body would let her, she would go for walks through the hills 
Uh, so she, she never lost that desire to be in, in, like physically in touch with the ground, have her fingers in the soil of her garden. I think you, you have to kind of look at those two, those two ideas as the, the through line of her entire career. And some works are more abstract and some mm -hmm. works are less abstract, but somehow it always comes back to this observation of the natural world and trying to capture the, 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 the experience of that more than the mere appearance of it. And even in paintings of New York City, you know, things that, are, that we don't think of as the natural world or as landscapes, they really are. And, and she really is thinking about the way in which the environment around us, whether it's, it's built or not by human hands, um, creates our experience of the world. And to translate that into color, to translate that into paint is her great gift to help us see things that we might not see otherwise. As she would say, to take time to look. That's this famous quote also she said, I think also in 29, um, in relation to her flower, paint, her flower mm. paintings, where she says, it's quoted very often, <laughs> um, that she paints these um, flowers as big because she wants to see um, that, she wants that people see the flowers as she has discovered them. And that's why she makes them so big. And sometimes she um, paints uh, mountains in New Mexico where you don't know exactly where she stands or where you are in it or far away, etc. So all these unusual perspectives and closeness and um, far away, I think that's very um, um, consciously mm -hmm. made and um, yeah, unique at the time. I, I agree. I, I've often said that in, in many ways the, su the, the subject of the painting is almost ir irrelevant. Mm -hmm. she, she, what she wants to do is play with paint. Mm -hmm. She wants to see what she can do with, with the basic tools of, of painting, color and composition and form to create something that, that we as viewers will respond to. And whether it's a, a rock, a bone, mm -hmm. a shell, a flower, a landscape, those are just excuses for her to start working with the paint. And that's where I think it always comes back in some way to that abstraction. We know that O'Keeffe lived in her time and took an interest in contemporary events. She read newspapers, she um, listened to the radio, and commented on the news in her letters. Nevertheless, her art seems to be detached from the circumstances of the time, which have little obvious impact on her work and therefore are rarely mentioned by art historians writing about her. At all the more striking are a few works because they do refer explicitly to contemporary events and are nevertheless an integral part of her work as an artist. For example, the flag from 1918, which, is, which was directly connected with O'Keeffe's concerns about the involvement of the USA in World War I. Her response to that is vividly documented by Amy von Lintel in her recently published wartime letters, beautiful to read, in, from Texas. A further example is the famous, already mentioned, Cow's Skull, Red, White and Blue from 1931, which is considered a national icon of American art and prominently usually displayed in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York but was also, as you said, viewed with a degree of irony by the artist herself. And I would be very interested to hear your thoughts on these sparse but definite allusions to contemporary events. One of the things that I think is interesting about O'Keeffe is she, um, 
she's very clever <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, to the point of, of being deceitful um, almost or disingenuous. You know, she'll say these things with absolute force. Um, my art is about this or that. Uh, and so she's so strong-willed and so confident that, that you really want to believe her. And so, you know, an example I would use is the, the, the other bone paintings, um, the cows, cows and other animals she found and painted. You know, she was adamant that these are not about death. You, in the grand tradition of art, I mean, this is an individual who knew her art history, who was very well trained. You can't paint bones and not think about memento mori paintings and understand that you're invoking, much less bones and flowers together, <laughs> that you're invoking this long history of paintings that are explicitly about our, our, our human frailty and, the, and the, the possibility, the eventuality of death. But she refused to, to let anyone claim that. The sexuality or sensuality of her flowers, you know, she adamantly disclaimed that that's what those paintings were about. Uh, and, and you know, consistently to the very end of her life said, if, you, if, you, if you're seeing that in my paintings, that says more about you than it does about me. And yet, this is an individual who participated with Stieglitz in the a remarkable series of portraits, including nudes. She was no prude. She was incredibly, I think, um, um, comfortable and, and, and kind of progressive for her times in terms of her own sense of herself as in her own body. Um, painted some, some frankly, quite, I, I find them not only provocative, but funny uh, drawings where she, she has what appear to be breasts that, that morph into avocados or alligator pears. And you can just see her kind of tweaking people, like, you think you know what this is, you don't. So there's this way in which she's, she's, she's messing with us. <laughs> she's, she's clever enough to, to know that, but you I know, think, the... As you say, she is clever. She was very clever, apparently but she was also a, a survivor. And um, I think this attitude she has also um, used or formed as a strategy yeah. to, um, to survive, to, well, and you have to, to be on her own. The art world, yeah. uh, when, as she's becoming famous, is a very small world. And a handful of critics can make or break an artist. And if they were supportive, fame and wealth. If they weren't, oblivion. And she somehow, I think, found another strategy to simply say, the critics don't have a clue what they're talking mm-hmm. about and they don't matter. Uh, and they just, she just moved right beyond them. <laughs> that brings me to the next question. <laughs> George O'Keefe is a woman artist. However, unlike many female artists of her generation, she was soon able to exhibit her work regularly with Stieglitz in his gallery. She was successful and not obviously disadvantaged as a woman. Although there are some indications that O'Keeffe had to struggle and fight for recognition. How does the George O'Keeffe Museum approach this subject? Has it addressed um, or is it currently addressing the topic of her as a woman artist? As you know, you know O'Keefe was was very adamant that she did not want to be called a yeah, woman yeah. artist. You know, she she repeatedly said, "I am a great artist." Period. My my gender has nothing to do, and I, I think that very much reflects the condition she was coming up in, where she, she knew every time someone said, "Oh, she's a great female painter," it was a dig. You know, for a woman, she's pretty good. I mean, that was the the, the <laughs> implication, and she just hated that, um, and rightfully. I think she, as she achieved her success, and as you pointed out, became more successful than many of the men, was selling her works for more than the men were making in, in the Stieglitz circle. Um, that gave her some, some great power uh, to be able to kind of claim a position that few others could claim. Uh, throughout her life, as I mentioned, she rejected feminism. Uh, she, she didn't want to be labeled as a feminist. Uh, because of that, as she, as she, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but she said, I didn't like it when the men put me in a box. I don't want the women to put me in a box either. She did not want to be defined by anyone else. Uh, Judy Chicago, you know, for the dinner project, very famously uh, made a plea to George O'Keefe, you know, will you help us? Will you be an advocate for other women artists? And O'Keefe refused. Um, and and to, to Judy's credit, she wrote a beautiful letter um, back to O'Keefe saying, you may not need us, but we need you. But it didn't swear. You know, she was unmoved. Um, we will come back to 
what mm -hmm. the museum. But um, here I would like to say um, um, I've, I'm, I'm very interested in biographies by women artists, not only as a contemporary one, that's not, so, I mean, that's interesting, but not in, in, in this perspective. But for example, when I made this exhibition, it was called Close Up with Nine artists from Impressionism to to, until today. It was so um, interesting to see that all of them did say what she said. They are just artists, good artists. And of course this is true, but all of them, and also O'Keeffe, I think, had to develop a strategy um, that um, other artists, male artists, it, um, don't have to yeah. think about. It's yep. not. It's not the point I want to um, argue. But it's. It was not so. It was not just that she. Um, she was a woman, and so she had to deal with that. Absolutely, and I think that that was part of the strategy was yeah. to kind of try to step yeah. outside of that. That circle. So in the museum, so, it's not really a... Well, it's, it, I think it, it's similar to the way we've, we've thought about her biography. Um, early on, we would, we would simply echo her own words and say, you know, we're about a great artist, period. Um, but her, her gender and the experience she had because of that is significant. It did shape the opportunity she had. It did shape the critical response to her work. Um, Positively and negatively, of course. you know, it, it gets complicated. But you know, would would she have gotten the attention from Stieglitz early on? You know, there's this famous, slightly contested line um, when he sees her first, when he first sees some of her works. Finally, a woman on paper, not finally great art on paper. Finally, a woman on paper, um, and it, in this this kind of um, unpleasant way, it follows other exhibitions he'd done of art, for example, by children. Because he's looking for, the, you know, it's like the idea of, of primitivism that was so popular at that time. Looking for creativity that's unmediated by education, unmediated by training, that's some natural expression of human creativity that convention hasn't shaped and formed. Because all the men get the education and know the conventions. But this naive woman supposedly would not be, you know, the truth is O'Keefe had the best art education you could get in the U.S. <laughs> and read everything. She knew what was happening all over the world. But it was easier to present her as this kind of, native flower that's just emerged from the prairie. Um, so I think for the museum, you know, we, we do, we are continuing to figure out how, how we can participate in a conversation about um, her own experience as a woman during her lifetime, but also what she continues to mean, the struggles that women continue to face. I mean, with the record-breaking prices that we're seeing at auction, we were just talking about the Warhol um, that has a, a regional connection um, <laughs> that sold for an insane amount of money. The record for Georgia for a woman artist at public auction is still Georgia O'Keeffe for the Jimson Weed that's in the show upstairs. That was set in 2014. That's insane. That should have been eclipsed multiple times. And not only is it insane that it hasn't been eclipsed, there's no one in the wings. There's almost no one in the wings in terms of who are the 10 other artists that might beat her. There aren't. I think that's when you see that, that the, the art world historically and continues to be incredibly um, unequal and uneven in terms of the opportunity. And so that's, that's where I think the museum does have an opportunity to think about why is that so? And she, is, she has more visibility than almost any other artist, any other female artist. Yeah, yeah. So That's interesting. Can we use that in a way that to at least illuminate some of these questions for mm -hmm. the art world? So, um, the art of O'Keeffe is generally seen appropriately in, re in relation to American modernism. During, during the preparation of, for the exhibition in Basel, I found it in increasingly interesting to look at O'Keeffe's late work in relation to the contemporary art of, young, of a younger generation, not in relation to hard edge painting of, or abstract expressionism, but to land art, and also on a related note to the mobiles of Alexander Calder, the, the apparent point of connection here 
is the desire to capture and convey the endless space of the American landscape, which seems so deeply formative to your country. Is that pure speculation <laughs> or is there also bio biographical evidence for such a view? I, I don't think it's pure speculation. And uh, the reason I say that is, you know, we know that O'Keefe was a, a very um, engaged, curious intellectual. She continued, even when she had more or less stopped painting, um, you know, in the 70s as her eyesight began to fail, um, she, she was really producing very little new artwork. Um, she was still going to galleries. She was still going to New York every year. She was still paying attention to what younger artists were doing. So there are these great accounts of her going to see a Rothko exhibition, for example. And I can kind of imagine her thinking, well, I've been doing color field painting for a lot longer than this guy has. <laughs> um, you know, there's this, she spends uh, time with, with Warhol. Warhol uh, features her in Interview Magazine. He comes to visit her in New Mexico. And again, I kind of imagine her thinking, you think you invented celebrity artist? I've been doing that for a long time too. <laughs> so, but she was, she was certainly paying attention to what was going on. A surprising number of artists made a pilgrimage or reached out to her in some ways. Some very famous, Kusama might be the most well-known. Um, Kusama wrote these letters to O'Keefe from Japan describing her ambitions to be an artist. And O'Keefe wrote back and said, if that's what you want to do, mm -hmm. it's going to be hard, but here's, here's what you need to do. And you're going to move to New York and you're going to do this and here's the path, but it'll be tough. And Kusama continues to, to this day to credit O'Keefe as a formative inspiration. Uh, James Terrell, uh, made a, made a, a road trip, a pilgrimage to see O'Keefe in her house in Abiquiu. And I always think about his, his um, rooms and her courtyard in Abiquiu, which has this high adobe parapet, um, brown mm -hmm. stucco now, but would have been mud plaster that isolates all the trees in the view. So all you see is the blue sky and you just see it mm -hmm. as a pure color in a way that you don't when you're looking at the landscape and have a horizon. I think of him and his rooms. So there's there are plenty of artists. So I, I, I think it's 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 hard to miss the dialogue that continues there. And you know, I I even didn't what but, but you're right. It's with Terrell, etc. I didn't even think on um, direct relations, mm -hmm. not at all, but just the uh, the spirit of this um, um, groundness of yeah. the space. Well, um, and the way you phrase the question, though, you kind of like what what this means for the kind of the American yeah. sense of identity and, and psyche, okay. and you know, the for for America's for the United States history, this idea of expansion and space, you know, whether it was the early Western art, I mean, mm -hmm. there's always been this kind of obsession with the grandness of the continent mm -hmm. and you know there's there's a there's a darker narrative underneath that of course of conquest and and possession and displacement of the people that were there um but she even as a young girl i mean in, in interviews in her life she would talk about um her her brothers and their their dime store novels of the west and having this fascination with the kind of cliched cowboys and indians of the west and so when she gets to Texas, she finds that big open landscape that is mirrored by her experience mm -hmm. in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is this, this way in which she and many, many other artists, there's the vastness of it um, mm -hmm. is incomprehensible almost. Mm -hmm. And it is captivating. What's interesting, back to her abstraction in a way, she rarely tries to do that big expansive view. Yeah. It's always about refinement and selection and, and honing in, zeroing in on one little perspective that you might not even notice if you're standing in front of this giant space. Mm -hmm. At our, we are coming to the end. <laughs> At our first meeting together with my colleagues from um, the Tourism Museum in Madrid and the Centre Pompidou in Paris, you said that the George O'Keeffe Museum is, if I remember correctly, is interested to see how European museums look at O'Keeffe's oeuvre and what the differences would be to the approach in exhibitions in mm -hmm. the US. I'm very curious to hear 
if your expectations have been met. <laughs> they have, they have. And you know, I think this is, this is also part of the history of the museum. Not only are we kind of you know, the, dedicated to her life and art, but we, we shape the way she is interpreted and seen. Um, the museum's first curator was Barbara Lines. Um, she's also the author of the Catalogue Raisonne. You know, she, she more than any single individual in history has shaped the interpretation of George O'Keefe. And she's a remarkable scholar who's done incredible work. Uh, but there is room for many voices. And I think for us, it's exciting to continue to open up the, 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 the conversation and get fresh perspectives and get new ways of looking at this. And, and each of your partners in this, you each brought a very different set of questions and a very different approach. You know, one of my, my great frustrations because of the pandemic is I was not able mm -hmm. to see the exhibition in the other venues. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't have the direct experience of the, of the final visual presentation other than through photos. But each installation has also been, even though it's almost identical in terms of the works, there's just a very few um, all substitutions at Quite each a institution. Few, 12. In here, 12 different ones, yeah. 12 new ones. Yeah. And some of them I didn't need. <laughs> you, there's no painting you don't need. <laughs> uh, but, but, to, but to see it kind of through each of your lenses has been really exciting and interesting. Uh, and I think we were just talking about kind of from the, the concept, kind of the, the intellectual concept to the installation. You create new juxtapositions. One of the things I love about seeing um, O'Keeffe, much less our own you know, museum's collection plus other loans, installed by another curator is you, you create juxtapositions and dialogues that we've never tried or we would, ne we would never try and go, oh, that's actually informative and exciting and I, would, I will do that when I bring these home. <laughs> I want to try that myself because it's, it's really appealing. So it's been very successful, I think, from that sense. Good. Do you have a, a question? Well, I think, I, you know, I, I know folks are, are eager to, to wrap up. Um, I would love to kind of reverse the question for you. Uh, you what about George O'Keefe captivated you? You know, you, you reached out with this, this interest in her. Uh, and, and what was that that first pulled you in and made you want to go further with an exhibition? What was the... My what, what, was, yeah, what about George O'Keefe really just captivated you and... There are many curators in the world. They, they don't all reach out. It sometimes I, feels like yeah, it, but yeah. they don't all reach out and want to launch a project. I didn't know her work very well, which I only discovered late. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, as I said before, I'm interested in good and um, artists, women artists also. Um, I have seen some of her works, you can see not the Metropolitan Flowers, um, the, the skyscrapes, etc. And um, I was always impressed by her direct style, um, her um, very appealing um, kind of painting. And um, when I um, started to um, also to, to delve in it, can you say that? Mm -hmm. um, I became confused um, how it's such a diversity of works. I didn't understand how they, they it's, it was not the chronology, how you um, could look at an artist's work in other cases, like, I don't know, Mondrian or Kandinsky. Where you or, kind of see a progression, yeah. At the same time, in the same year, completely different paintings, and etc. Um, that was solved when I realized how much connected um, she is to the places she lives in. And um, as there was a lot of quest many questions, not all are answered, <laughs> of course. Um, also, mis mystery because. Somehow it, as I say, was is very appealing work, but also a kind of distanced um, imagery. Also, and also I must say, I I always thought because, as you say, Stieglitz um, um, for Stieglitz she was the American artist. I understood 
that um, at the time when in Europe the avant-garde was um, top, in America there was no real young contemporary art. So it was a great task and um, achievement from Stieglitz that he um, made this somehow. But why so much um, focus on American, um, on the nation, etc. That um, was also something I had to understand. So you see, mm -hmm. it's um, it's a great it's a great artist to um, deal to have to deal with or to be able to deal with and to show, as you can see. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Cody. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.